The global financial crisis and all that it has stood for has jolted our world into a titanic battle of ideas about how we can enjoy the best of free market capitalism and meet the expe expectations of society at the same time. Enlightened self-interest, as it was known in the 17th and 18th centuries by philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes and even Adam Smith. Now, as we tumble from company debt to sovereign debt, entire countries have been rendered bankrupt. Others are very close to it. Livelihoods have been lost, and estimates are that 50 million more people have entered poverty than otherwise would have been the case. And this battle of ideas is being waged at the highest levels of government, in the courts, in the blogospheres, and in people's homes. Many companies have lost their license to operate, and that license is now in the hands of regulators, litigators, and civil society. And there are signs that these changes will be micromanaged for years to come through an unprecedented array of regulation and of policy. Some truly believe that our markets will normalize soon and that we can continue as before, whereas others see a new future that is more in tune with the economic and social realities of the 21st century. Now, the magnitude of these changes should not be underestimated, and especially not by investors. In 1968, just months before he was shot dead, Bobby Kennedy delivered a speech that is now regarded as one of the finest oratories of the 20th century. In that speech, he questions the lunacy of an accounting system for GDP that cannot distinguish between productive and unproductive spending. And here is some of what he said. Our gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for those who break them. It counts the destruction of our redwoods. It counts napalm, Whitman's rifle, and Speck's knife. In short, it measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. Now, I'm sure that Bobby Kennedy would be delighted with many of the alternative systems that are now widely used to measure the intangible wealth of countries. Things like the value of life expectancy, education levels, human capital, environmental health, social cohesion, and good governance, none of which can be found in GDP. And for similar reasons as those which drive the GDP accounting debate, a significant number of investors are now starting to question how much corporate accounting systems can tell us about the real value of companies in the 21st century. On the screen is one of the many studies that have been undertaken over the years about the steady and persistent rise in this intangible value of companies. Now the data was collected over 27 years and the main point here is that the intangible value of companies in this time has grown from 5% to 72%. Asset managers support this thesis as well, and they believe that somewhere between 77 and 85% of company value is driven by intangible factors, such as environmental or social or governance issues. Now, failing to consider these issues will not make them go away. It will only bring about more of the surprises that we would rather leave well behind. Now, this slideshow today is not a history of responsible investment or a list of definitions. It's a small selection of stories that's been put together by leading researchers and by the Responsible Investment Association to describe the world we are in today, and especially the way that environmental and social and governance issues are affecting the investments that we hold in trust on behalf of so many people. And my one hope is that I'm able to persuade you that these issues are not isolated, and that by understanding some of the parts, we may better understand the whole. For investors, the 21st century has opened the door to issues that are unfamiliar, volatile, complex. Climate change is one outstanding example, but there are many others as well. Our urgent need for more water, tensions between regions over food security and energy supplies, the end of cheap oil, the rise of emerging nations, growing urbanization, Soaring rates of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, much stronger calls to end poverty, and finally, this scarcity of all of our natural resources in the face of this ballooning population. These issues are not only human issues, they're issues which have a cost, a cost for economies, 
for individuals and for industry. Now, whether those costs be short-term, long-term, devastating or incremental, or the very real cost of simply missing an opportunity, some of the world's largest financial institutions want to find out exactly what those costs are. Consider this. It has taken mankind 160,000 years to gently meander towards a population of 2 billion. And you can see that that was in 1945. But in just 65 years since then, our population has tripled. And it will increase by another 3 billion by 2050. As our population grows, more of us are moving from the land to cities. More city life results in higher wages, more consumption, more diets rich in meat and dairy, more demand for energy, for water, more pollution, and more waste to get rid of. And whether we like it or not, our planet is now hitting its limits. This century will be defined as the century of resource scarcity. Scarcity of oil, of land, food, forest, fish, clean air, and clean water. And the study of population demographics and resource scarcity is compounded by one of the greatest economic investment challenges of our time, and that's food scarcity. In 2007 and 2008, riots broke out in over 30 countries across the world as basic food commodity prices broke all previous records, from Yemen to Russia, from Pakistan to Egypt, Violent demonstrations became the tipping point for new reforms and new thinking about agriculture, population growth, and food security. Sometimes such uprisings come and go, never to be seen again, but not so with food. This theme is here to stay. And in 2009, for the first time ever, the number of people who the UN described as chronically hungry rose over 1 billion. In January 2011, the United Nations World Food Price Index broke records again, exceeding the 2008 levels that sparked such deadly riots. And in December 2010, the cost of food was up 25% from the year before as Chinese demand rose and Russia had its worst drought in over 50 years. Now our population graph a few minutes ago is a salient reminder that if feeding 6.5 billion people is a challenge, try imagine feeding 9 billion. And in just a few years, a confluence of events has meant that agriculture has become an investment story with the health and survival of billions as its key driver. <coughs> a report in 2009 by Deutsche Bank called Investing in Agriculture tells us how many more hectares we will need to feed those 9 billion people by 2050. If you look at the yellow sections, that shows the current land use for each of these crops. And the pink section shows how much more land we will need for those crops by 2050. And those pink bars, they add up to 685 million hectares. Does anyone know how big that is? Yes, 685. It's a big piece of land. Big island. Is it the size of Australia? It's the size of Australia, Paul. That's right. Well, practically, the size of Australia is 768 million hectares. So we need just a little bit less than that, and it all has to be arable. Now, if you look at this graph, it shows us how much less land we would need if we employ better technology. The Deutsche Bank research shows that investment in sustainable agriculture could more than half the need for extra land to feed our people. And that's why a large number of super funds in New Zealand, Scandinavia, and Australia have started to invest in this area. But there's another reason as well, because by necessity, these large super funds, they spread their assets across the world, across sectors, and over long time horizons, and they have a vested interest in geopolitical stability. Investment in sustainable agriculture that can result in more output from less land may actually avert a looming geopolitical disaster. And here's why. The United Nations reports that 30 million hectares of African farmland has been purchased by Asian countries and Gulf states recently. And that's just a little less than the size of Germany, to put it in perspective. South Korea has bought 1.3 million hectares in Madagascar, and Saudi Arabia has bought 500,000 hectares in Tanzania. And there's a long list after that. And if there was ever a foundation for geopolitical unrest, 
this would be it. Now let's take a look at how an example of how the quest for productivity improvements and food security has made its way into the investment world. Because as developing countries grow more affluent, they eat more meat and dairy. Between 1970 and 2005, total meat production in developing countries increased from 27 to 147 million tons per annum. That's over five times in 35 years. More meat and dairy means that you need more grains to feed the cows and the pigs and the sheep. And as the grain production grows, goes up, so does the trade in fertilizer, as this graph shows. And during the 2008 food shortages, for instance, I mentioned a moment ago, fertilizer costs increased dramatically. And you can think about BHP's persistent and hostile takeover bid for potash, which controls 20% of the world's potassium fertilizer market. That deal is worth $39 billion and may provide a glimpse into the future of the investment market for agriculture. But the question for analysts is which companies are best positioned to outperform from the world's quest to feed the 9 billion people. And the march towards food security <coughs> runs in parallel with calls for security around another one of life's fundamental needs, energy. The term energy security first found its way into the common vernacular over the last decade as three very big ideas collided. Global terrorism, oil escalating to over $140 a barrel, and the elevation of the idea of peak oil from the lunatic fringe to the International Energy Agency. Let's start with the end of cheap oil. We've now reached a time when our daily use of oil outstrips the amount that we're able to extract. And this International Energy Agency tells us that what oil is left is now harder and more expensive to reach. Here's one way to look at it. When oil production first began in 1850, you didn't need to do much to get the oil out of the ground. In fact, in those days, the energy from one barrel of oil would be all you need to extract 50 barrels of oil from the ground. Today, the energy from one barrel of oil will extract five barrels of oil. And for tar sands and shale oil, the energy from one barrel of oil gets you, you guessed it, one barrel of oil. And you may be thinking this isn't a great business model, unless, of course, you're the recipient of government subsidiaries, um, subsidies sorry, for oil exploration. But the chief economist of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Baral, said recently, one day we will run out of oil. It won't be today, it won't be tomorrow, but one day we will run out. And we have to leave oil before it leaves us. And the concurrent stories of terrorism and peak oil and rising oil prices They've bought into very sharp focus the sensible idea that sovereign states should, as much as possible, take control of their own energy supply. As George Bush Jr. said in the late noughties, the people with all the oil are the people who don't like us very much. That's my George Bush. <laughs> President Obama put it a little more bluntly when he signed the Clean Energy Act in February 2009. Because we know we can't power America's future on energy that's controlled by foreign dictators, we are taking big steps down the road to energy independence, he said. And in December 2009, the world leaders gathered in Copenhagen for the 14th United Nations Climate Change Conference. And while a global price on carbon was not achieved, participant nations signed an agreement that two degrees warming above pre-industrial levels is the upper limit of climate change if we want to maintain economic and social stability. Now, two degrees warming will take us to 450 parts per million of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. In Antarctica, measurements of CO2 go back 650,000 years through seven warming periods, seven cooling periods, and never once in all of that time have CO2 concentrations ever gone past three hundred parts per million. Dr. Fatih Barol recently said again, the door to reach two degrees is about to close. In 2017, it will be closed forever. And this is where the clean technology investment story begins. The International Energy Agency has calculated that to cap our global warming at two degrees, or 450 parts per million, the world economy will require 2.7 trillion 
US dollars in extra investment in clean technology between 2010 and 2020. And a further 9.3 trillion US dollars will be needed between 2021 and 2030. Now, that's 12 trillion dollars, US dollars, in 20 years going directly into clean tech investment. And regardless of government malaise, investment in clean tech is already well underway. These statistics from Bloomberg give you a great feel for investments being made across the globe, and in particular, the enormous enthusiasm for clean tech coming from China. And what's even more interesting here is China's amazing commitment to wind. And that reached 25 billion in 2009, way ahead of any other country in the world. And now from our clean tech story, we move to the story of BP. Anyone who ever wondered about the link between occupational health and safety and company profits, spare a thought for investors and pension fund beneficiaries with shares in BP, and for the 11 people who lost their lives in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on the 20th of April in the Gulf of Mexico. As 2010 began, BP's share price was sitting around $60. Two months after the accident, its share price had halved to about $30. And of course, it has still not recovered. And the total legal and cleanup bill for BP so far is $39.9 billion. On the investment side, stock price losses are only the beginning. Bills being considered in Congress at the moment propose that insurance for offshore drilling be raised to at least $10 billion coverage for drilling operations, leaving only BP, Shell, and Exxon able to afford these premiums. Another ESG, environmental social governance issue, another license to operate in the hands of government, and more regulation is on its way. And many are now wondering, how much could investors have known about this accident before it happened? Here's how much. In 2005, BP received the largest ever criminal fine delivered by OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Authority in the United States. The fine was $50 million, and it followed the explosion at their Texas city refinery, which killed 15 people and injured 170. Just four years later, in 2009, OSHA imposed another record fine of $87 million for BP for failing to correct these safety hazards from the 2005 explosion. And here's what lies at the heart of the problem, though. These figures, again from OSHA, show that between June 2007 and February 2010, BP incurred 760 egregious and willful citations, the worst kind, across six refineries. The combined citations in this category for all other 145 refineries in the US was one. And as I said, in case you're not aware, an egregious willful citation is the most dangerous type of citation there is. Could analysts have known this information? Is this information material to BP's value? Could this information have been factored into the company's discounted rate? Would BP's shares price have been different if this information had been widely understood? The answer to all of the above is yes, 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 and yes. And it reveals why we need more information and better information about the types of issues that are driving company value in our brave new world. And the threat of regulation and policy change is compounded, also further now, by pressure on corporations from investors who raise resolutions at AGMs. In 2001, there are 262 environmental and social resolutions raised by investors in the United States. By 2008, that figure had risen to 55% to a high of 410. And this is where the story becomes even more interesting. The four vote for these resolutions has more than doubled in that time. And now we're going to look at a very quick handful of case studies to get a flavor for the kind of issues that investors are targeting, and targeting with increasing success. IdaCorp investors succeeded in their bid for the company to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. And the vote makes history as the first climate <coughs> change resolution to attract more than 50% of support. Massey Energy investors follow suit with a 54% win. Lane Christensen investors demand a sustainability report, and I believe they now have one. Two issues never seen before in a resolution attract votes above 30%, coal waste disposal, and of course fracking, which is a major issue here in Australia as well. 
And there's even one for the chickens. 10% better welfare for chickens. An indicator of things to come also on the mounting issue of tar sands extraction in Canada. And from regulation and investor pressure at AGMs, our story moves into the emerging markets, and which is, that's where ESG research really comes into its own. And the temptation of double-digit returns in these burgeoning markets is increasingly challenged by the risks associated with human rights, unpriced environmental damage, bribery, corruption, poor systems of governments. Let's take a look at the story of a British company called Asia Energy. In 2005, the company raised 33 million pounds to build an open pit coal mine and a power plant in Bangladesh. Asia Energy claimed that the $3 billion project would add 1% to Bangladesh's GDP and 10% to the country's energy supply by 2015. But in 2006, community unrest and civil protests began to escalate over discoveries that the mine would displace 50,000 people and that fertile agricultural land would be destroyed. And this information was absent from the initial feasibility studies presented by Asia Energy to the Bangladeshi government. But it didn't take long for it to be discovered by the activists. Protesters went on the rampage, ransacking and setting fire to Asia Energy's facilities. The protests spurred a day-long general strike across the entire country. And soon after, government denied permission for Energy Asia, Asia Energy to move ahead. And on news of the withdrawal of the mining rights, shares in the company crashed from 284p to 117 in a single day. They were then suspended from trading for six weeks, and they reopened at 95. The company later changed its name to GCM Resource. And four years later, in early 2010, the company finally submitted new plans to the government, which are still under consideration. A more widely known story about investment risk in emerging nations concerns the Chinese milk scandal of 2008. A week before the Beijing Olympics began on August 8, 2008, Chinese officials learned that baby formula made by one of, the one of the city's biggest companies was tainted with a toxic chemical. They said nothing. It wasn't until five weeks later, after the Olympics closed, that officials notified the government, spurring the now famous recall on milk made by the Sanlu group. The toxic chemical that Sanlu added to the milk was called melamine, normally used to make plastics, fertilizers. The reason the milk producers add the chemical is because it gives the appearance of heightened protein. By the time the investigation was finished, 21 companies were implicated. 300,000 babies became ill, 1,300 were hospitalized, some with acute kidney failure, and eventually six died. In November 2009, these two men were executed for making and selling hundreds of tons of melamine products. The World Trade Organization says it's one of the worst food safety events it's ever had to deal with. Chinese dairy products are still avoided by Chinese mothers. These stories and our own investment instincts tell us that there's so much more responsible investment information that we need to know before we can feel really confident about our investment choices in emerging nations. And I'll finish here. In recent years, ESG knowledge has escalated dramatically, making its way through the entire investment chain. Behind me are the names of asset managers, asset owners, representing over $30 trillion in assets under management. These organizations have all signed the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, and they've pledged to take environmental, social, and governance issues into account in their investment decisions. This is one quarter of all the world's funds under management. Australia and New Zealand together now have one of the largest number of signatories to the UN PRI with 143. The US comes second with 150 and the UK with 121. So we should be proud that this part of the world is leading in some ways in responsible investment. And as we reflect on these stories from the world we're in, and we look at this list of signatories, we're reminded of why responsible investment has come to the fore, and why now. And if you look at some of the names, you'll see that responsible investment is not radical, it's not soft. In fact, it may well turn out to be one of the most powerful, prudent, and conservative investment styles that we've seen in decades. Thank you. <laughs>